Hi, this is Gavin from FE News, and I've got a great pleasure to be chatting with Chris Jones from Ofsted. And we're going to be running a little mini series on the free eyes. Hi, thanks, Gavin. Um, yeah, Chris Jones from Ofsted, specialist advisor for further education and skills. I want to talk to you about the quality of education and within that, the three eyes intent, implementation, and impact. Implementation, obviously embedded within the, the quality of education. And if intent is about why you're doing what you're doing, implementation is actually about, well, okay, how are you delivering it? What are you doing to ensure that learners um, get the best out of uh, the programs that you're teaching? Now, one of the things that we have to think about these days in terms of implementation is the fact that it, our whole system has changed um, in that we now have right across the piece education and training programs be it a levels btechs uh, vocational qualifications apprenticeships that now rely on an endpoint assessment whether that's the a level examination an exam at the end of two years of study or the endpoint assessment within the apprenticeship now that means that in terms of implementation we need to be thinking about how young people and adults following any of the types of programs that we're delivering remember what we've learned what they've learned you know sort of it, it's they don't have to remember in short blocks anymore like if we're following a modular a level or doing a you know a unit in an apprenticeship framework it's a question you know because it's thinking all the time about well if i'm learning this how does that then impact upon what i'm going to apply at work or what I'm going to learn next. So implementation then is about how teachers and trainers plan for the sequence of learning that a learner or apprentice has to go through in order to develop the knowledge, skills and behaviours that they need in order to be successful in their studies, be that passing the examination or applying a set of skills at work. You know, so that, it, that, that then, you know, the implementation then is about, okay, the planning. How do you plan it and sequence it over a period of time? What are the key points that you, from your experience as a teacher or trainer, need to think about in making sure that learners progress from what they know already and build on knowledge and skills over time you know and, and, and thinking about okay in order to move on to this next area that i want the students to learn or know about then they have to be really secure in this previous bit of knowledge and then thinking do i have time to reiterate that do i you know do i build it what kind of what are the layers that a learner has to go through in order to secure that knowledge and apply those skills and to be able to, in a sense, problem solve as they go through the learning experience. Because if it's a linear exam, you know, they, they may well be having to draw upon things they learned in the first three weeks of study at the beginning of their two year program. Um, you know, so that it's that all those kind of things that need to be thought about in planning the curriculum. So implementation will be about how you plan and sequence the curriculum. Obviously, there are going to be elements around, OK, well, what happens then in classroom sessions or workshop sessions? You know, sort of how does teaching prepare students to learn about, remember and recall what's actually happened. You know, so there's sort of, you know, therefore, while we're still holding fast to the, to the principle that we do not grade lessons, that we do not sit in a, a, a single lesson and make a judgment, what we will be looking for is, is over a period of time, by looking at schemes of work, by looking at the work that students and learners and apprentices have done, how they are improving in their work, so that you can then see that sort of the 
implementation over time. How does teaching change as a result of what learners know already? So what are the key sequences that learners then have to build upon? And, and so, so implementations more than just standing in front of a group of learners and teaching, it's got to be about that whole wraparound thing about how you plan that teaching, how you reflect upon that planning, the feedback that you give to learners, how they use that feedback to improve what they've done in the past and how you as a teacher you know, set or trainer keep track of that uh, to ensure that all learners make the progress that they should. You know, so the sort of implementation too implies then that there are, there are sort of there are key elements of initial assessment knowing what they come in with and then setting the expectations about what they should achieve as a result of that but without setting artificial boundaries of what a student should achieve you know, I think there's a there's a mantra that I always used to use when I was a teacher trainer many years ago that, you know, children and young people live down to expectations. So keep your expectations really high. You know, and I think that's the sort of, in a sense, the, the, the principle that we want to see within this sort of the, the, the implementation is that focus on what learners need to know, what the curriculum requires them to learn, what the... Uh, apprenticeship standard requires them to exemplify and demonstrate at work once they've qualified uh, and all that sort of thing needs to be built into the teacher's planning and delivery of learning and training over the sequence of time for which the program is intended. And have you seen, uh, there's a couple of questions that sort of that come into, into mind, is um, it's really to better help um, training providers, colleges, employer providers, how to evidence this for you. So it's about sure. to show like, um, what, what sort of good examples have you seen of, you know, either looking at the individual, looking at the employer needs and bringing the two together of how the implementation has been delivered because learner X started with here, but we've gone through this plan to get into here because the employer requires this. What, what yes. good ways are, are there of sort of, of evidence in that? Because everyone has obviously got the intention of wanting people to progress. Otherwise, you know, while why are we here type of thing. But how are good ways that you've seen to evidence that for providers, um, you know, training providers, employer providers and colleges? I think the, one of the key things is, is, is to really ensure that student work or learner work, the work that apprentices do, be that written work or products that they've produced, that there's clear evidence of, in a sense, a starting point, something that they did at the beginning of a, a, a program, and then looking through work scrutiny, how that's improved over time. So in a sense, then, teachers and learners need to be thinking about how they demonstrate that improvement over time. So that, that, that's, in a sense, you know, getting the evidence right. Now, that's part and parcel of what they do anyway. It's just a matter of sort of being more organized, perhaps, in, in enabling us to see that. Um, I think as well, you know, what I, I was thinking about this the other day when I was talking with some employers, and we were talking about endpoint assessment. Now, in apprenticeships, now if endpoint assessment requires learners to um, have a professional discussion, then in a sense, there should be evidence early on of tutors and trainers working with students, having a professional discussion to talk about the work that they've done. You know, like, tell me how this demonstrates this particular bit of knowledge. Talk to me about something you did at work last week and how that's impacted upon what we've been learning at college today. You know, so that the, the, the use then to talking about that so that that kind of process too should provide the kind of evidence that sort of says, well, you know, this learner is getting better at. Student work in written work should also demonstrate that they're getting better at detailed descriptions. 
because that's the kind of evidence that they need to demonstrate. So you can see that the sort of the implementation needs to be thinking about the work that students are doing in a sense, making sure that students have that work available. Um, and part of that is sort of being organized. And, you know, I suppose that's the holy grail of teaching, isn't it? To have a class of students that have well-organized portfolios or pieces of work or, you know, that you can look at and see that progress over time. But I suppose that's the kind of thing that we'd, we'd want to see. Schemes of work obviously help because that gives you a picture of what you plan to deliver. But actually, there's nothing worse than a very clean scheme of work. Because if a scheme of work is produced for teaching in September or at the beginning of a program, and then, you know, if I come in in November or December and the scheme of work looks exactly the same and the teacher hasn't scrolled all over it and gone, oh, they didn't get this at the end of that session, or therefore I need to recover this, or they've moved on more quickly. So you'd expect to see flex in a scheme of work to sort of demonstrate that things have either gone better, they didn't understand, so therefore I had to te change my teaching plan or a teaching strategy to make sure that they had this foundation before I then moved on to the next bit of knowledge. Because if they didn't get this bit, the progress that they'd make elsewhere would be a bit challenging. You know, in that respect, learning is a bit like a Jenga tower, isn't it? You know, that sort of, you get a Jenga tower with gaps in the bottom, um, and, you know, one of the things we do with knowledge and, and skills, we keep piling stuff on the top of it. Um, but, if, but for learning, it, actually, if we don't fill those gaps back in at the bottom, then the whole thing becomes unstable as we pile stuff on top. And that's one of the things we've got to be, think about in terms of a scheme of work that doesn't look at gaps in knowledge and skills is something that would show that actually teachers aren't thinking about getting those basics absolutely nailed before that. And obviously people will say, well, you know, the curriculum's full enough anyway, and I've only got this amount of time in order to ensure that. But I suppose that's what makes learning interesting in that we have to learn from mistakes. We have to learn from our experiences as teachers and trainers so say, well, okay, last year, this is where the pitfalls were. So in my planning, I'm going to sort of aim to fill those blocks in. You know, in a college, um, le teachers or departments may well recognise that students from some schools will have this set of skills and students from other areas might, you know, oh, we know that from that school, they're not as strong in this particular area, therefore. And as in apprenticeships, initial assessments might tell you that, or sort of, you know, interviews with learners at the beginning, uh, if they've come from an employer about the strengths and weaknesses that they have, should enable you to think in terms of implementation about the, sort of the gaps that you need to fill. So it's part of that too, in terms of having that evidence at the beginning uh, for each individual learner um, and then sort of working out how we're going to fill, fill the gaps and make sure that people progress at the rate that we expect them to. Chris, that is really, really helpful. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Why not click subscribe so you can be informed when the latest next individual podcast or podcast mini-series from FE News are going to be released. Thank you.